investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. We are live. Welcome to the Token Metrics Monday live stream. I'm your host, Bill Noble, joined by my colleague, Forrest. Forrest, how you doing? I'm doing well, Bill. You know what I'm doing right now? Tell me. I'm going, I'm going to the YouTube live stream and I'm hitting share and I'm sharing it on Twitter. But you know what I did before I did that? Oh, tell I me. Like, I hit the like button. I hit the like button and I'm already subscribed, of course. But if you're not subscribed, you may want to may want to pop the subscribe button while you're while you're there. It's all in the same vicinity. It's very easy to do. It takes like five seconds. Yes, folks, help us so we can help you hit that like button. Uh, Cypher first on the stream. Garo, Eddie, okay, MMK56, welcome, welcome to all our friends. This live stream is brought to you by tokenmetrics.com and the tokenmetrics.com quant department. Those are the guys that do all the math. So welcome to the stream. Like and subscribe. We have an announcement today that the market update that you get on the Wednesday and Thursday streams will now be its own live stream. We haven't figured out what exact time of the day, but it's going to be Monday through Friday for the market update. So this would be an extra incentive to not only subscribe, but turn on alerts so you don't miss the market update during this very important time of the year. Back in 2017, this was a really volatile period. So we're coming at you five days a week. We will let you know what time. We actually did it today. Thank you for those who hopped on that stream. And without further ado, let's do the market update. Shopping after dropping. So the market's kind of all red. Uh, we expect that to continue for a week. Let's dive in. Bitcoin looking at a complete history going back to, say, 2016. Every time there's an intersection between legacy and crypto, okay, there's kind of a Bitcoin dump, right? In technical analysis, things happen in threes. So in 2017, they introduced the CME Bitcoin futures contract, and the market went down for three years. Back in the spring, they introduced the Coinbase IPO, Okay, which had probably involved a lot of people selling Bitcoin to buy Coinbase. And Bitcoin went down for three months. Now, the third occurrence is the introduction of the Bitcoin futures ETF, which could lead to a week, three weeks. So three years, three months, three weeks. This week, we suspect, is the third week of corrective activity which is a nice way of saying the market may suck, but that is the best time to do research, especially with our sponsor, okay, and us to figure out what coins you want to get into. And as Forrest will tell you uh, over and over in his wisdom that you want to get good coins at good entry points. So let's talk about entry points. Let's see if I can come up with a scenario that works. Normally, looking at total two. So that's everything excluding Bitcoin. So ETH and all altcoins. Trends usually last about 45 to 47 days. Washouts and corrections usually last nine to 10. And then if there are big parabolic up moves, that usually lasts 23 days. So in this case, where are we in the picture? Well, the correction started on the 10th with that big reversal day. So my estimate of when a rally might resume would be on the 21st of November. So right before the American Thanksgiving Day holiday. And that rally might last into December 
possibly December 14th. Now, will it be a parabolic rally? Will it be a smaller rally? I don't know. Stay tuned for Forrest because he's got a scenario on like when Bitcoin might peak. So he's probably got work as to when he thinks it might go parabolic. If not, my estimate would be that there's going to be something good happening between like November 21st and say December 10th. And then there's possibly another leg in January. You have to watch out for tax loss selling. You have to watch out for people taking profits. But if we go by this diagram, corrective washout should end soon. Bitcoin chart, BTC futures, looking at the CME. Why? Because that's what the ETF holds. So Bitcoin had its big chance to break out. It couldn't. Frankly, that's not a surprise because of the weirdness regarding the ETF. If there's a washout, it could go to 58. 54 is a number I heard um, through an institutional webinar. Or we could just sit here because <laughs> that's what Bitcoin has been doing, just sitting here. If Bitcoin takes off, it could go to 75, 88, or 91. If it drops, it's 58 or 54. And unfortunately, that's pretty much it for Bitcoin. Not expecting Bitcoin to wake up until right before Thanksgiving. Now, ETH versus Bitcoin, expecting ETH to outperform. The, the range that ETH versus Bitcoin has been trading in has been contracting. Okay. So there's this larger flag formation that shows ETH should do way better than Bitcoin on the next rally. In the meantime, we're all getting bored to death and even more so because the range of ETH versus Bitcoin just sits there. So I would expect that there would be a big surge in ETH versus Bitcoin around Thanksgiving because if it's ever going to move, this is, you, this is typical in crypto, right? Things just sit and then it just gets so contracted and so boring that you don't even want to keep the chart anymore because I draw the charts by hand. And when I don't want to draw the charts anymore, when I just can't stand making these ridiculously small candles on the chart, that's when it moves. And that may be what's going on in ETH versus Bitcoin. Okay, so expecting ETH outperformance before and after Thanksgiving. Now, Litecoin, the coin I hate to love. Unfortunately, every time this coin moons, the market cracks and goes down. I even said on a market update on Token Metrics TV that I was hoping that I actually dared uttered the, more, the four most dangerous words in the history of mankind. This time is different. I really did think or was hoping that this time would be different for the future of money trade and it wouldn't be just Bitcoin. If the market gets hammered and Litecoin could hold in, I would be encouraged that there actually could be trend continuation in Litecoin. The key level, let me say that again, the key level is 220. So if you can buy it at 220 and put a stop below 198, that will be the test as to whether or not Litecoin could turn around and really continue to go up because I do think headed into the end of the year, we may be looking at something where, you know, stuff that has outperformed, uh, I'm sorry, stuff that underperforms, like Litecoin, starts outperforming. Casper is another one I'm looking at. I don't have the chart right now, but I'm actually looking at stuff that hasn't rallied yet and wondering if it can, even if the market is sideways. Chainlink. People are always asking for tutorials on technical analysis. The chain link chart in many ways is a tutorial on technical analysis. It, it shows you how difficult it is to trade in a range. Visually, it doesn't look like anything's happening. But when chain link was at 23 in September, it looked like it was going to go to zero. And at 37, I was actually reaching for the lampshade to put on my head because I thought Chainlink and DeFi and Solana were all going to break out. Lo and behold, as soon as I even thought that, the whole market turned around and dumped. 
And now Chainlink has rejected the top end of its range. So at the bottom of a range, everyone is emotional, selling to cool and calm buyers. And at the top, emotional buyers, okay, are getting their crypto from cool, calm, relaxed sellers. Now let's talk legacy. What is good for crypto? What is good for crypto is that the economy is decent so that, you know, stocks continue to go up, but it's not too hot that the Fed has to come in and do something drastic about inflation. Now they may have to do that anyway, but they may just be on what I call the ignoring pathway where they're just going to ignore it until it's terrible or it's so bad they have to do something. So I'm checking legacy markets for signs of Goldilocks. Not too hot, not too cold. So crude oil going up, creating some pain at the pump. Americans get really whiny about gas prices. I know our friends in Europe and London, got a lot of readers and listeners out there. You guys are dealing with a much more serious situation, I believe. However, in the US, when US crude oil topped, I thought it was going to top at 80. Naturally, it went to 85 because it always goes farther than you think, and then it comes off. So if oil can fall back below $78, that might provide some cooling effect and not make the Fed have to go on the war path. Copper, same thing. Copper is very much associated with economic growth. Now, all year long on the market update on TMTV, I've been talking about the, the trade of the year was to effectively buy a coin underneath resistance on a dip and then hold on and let the big green candle happen when it goes through the resistance point. So it's like getting long in advance of what you think is a breakout. Now, copper is not crypto. Copper is at resistance, but it's not backing off. So if copper hangs out, that could be good. If copper breaks out, that could be good as long as it's not crazy because copper and ETH uh, move together. ETH moves with metals. So I would like it if copper could chill out or break out slowly. Now that segues into gold. There are a lot of things in the equity market that you need to pay attention to. GDXJ is one of them. GDXJ is a, uh, an index of small gold mining stocks and it's been rallying hard. So that means gold may start going up. It also might mean Bitcoin could follow gold after Thanksgiving. So this could be a leading indicator that what I would call hard money, gold, silver, Bitcoin, and even ETH could start rallying. Now, KuCoin Weekly Index, sponsored by the quant team at tokenmetrics.com, shows a 24% allocation to PAX Gold. That could be because gold is about to moon, or it could be because the market's probably going to get hammered this week. Also of note in this index is Binance Coin showing up as a 20% allocation. Increasingly from our premium customers, I'm getting asked more and more to look at coins that are on PancakeSwap. So even though the market's correcting today, speculative fires are still burning bright. Now, if there is another leg, okay, I mean, Binance Coin has 1x, okay, since October. But if there's another leg up, Binance Coin could do what AVAX did, Solana did, even, you know, ETH and all these other coins. They kind of went through their old May highs like they weren't even there. It looked like resistance, but it actually wasn't. So once this decline stops, if there's a dip in Binance coin, that may be an opportunity because if Bitcoin, uh, I'm sorry, if Binance coin continues to show up in some of our indices, that could be a sign that Binance coin could take off when the market turns. Now, Solana. You can tell this trade is getting mature because charting it has gone from easy street to difficult, right? There's a GAN line around 236. One minute Solana is breaking out, then it's running stops below it. It's really making it hard for people to figure out when to get into Solana. 
And it's not making it easy because after, you know, doing a false breakout and then stopping everybody out, now it's really getting painful and that it just seems to sit there. Now, I guess if the whole market gets hammered, Solana could go to 180, but that almost feels like wishful thinking. Honestly, Solana's probably going to go sideways, be annoying, act like ETH and just sort of go sideways and then lurch higher. I don't know. It could go to 280. It could go to 580. It depends on what kind of move we get, you know, between the American, ho the Western holidays and possibly what happens in January. Okay, near. Same deal. Same deal, right? Great project. Everyone knows it. It got down close to support at 9.2. Everybody was a buyer below 10. Everybody was a seller above 12. And the question is, where should I buy near, not investment advice? Okay, so there's two ideas. Um, you know, you can buy near on Friday and hope it's over on Saturday, as in the decline, or maybe Saturday and hope it's over on Sunday. Or you can hold out and see if it goes all the way down to nine or even flushes everybody out to eight. It depends on how, how much crypto gets hammered this week, if at all. Remember what my colleague says, you wanna have good projects at good entry points. Is 11 a good entry point in near? Well, I don't know. Has that worked out since mid-October? No, it hasn't. You've been better off buying near at the bottom end or on a dip even before it took off. Okay, when it took off at the end of October, there were three days of dips and sideways action to get involved. So you want to buy on red? That's a good idea. That's better than buying on green at this point. How big the dip is, we'll find out. Okay. Patience is okay. Developing a watch list is okay. Speaking of a watch list, I know y'all want it. Polka dot. Now, honestly, I had my FOMO hat on. I really thought this thing was going to 58. Naturally, it turns around and now it's being really annoying. It's sitting on support at 44. And I can't tell whether the bargain is a flush to 38, which is the 38% retracement of the recent up move. Personally, I would prefer, even if the market goes down, that Polkadot trades sideways on top or just below 44. That's a 23% retracement. Now, why is that relevant? Inequities, in my experience from days of old, when something would go up and then come down and only be able to trace 23%, that's a sign of like a mega uptrend. So, you know, I know I just talked about near or Solana dipping and hoping that would happen. That's at least for near, but you know, with polka dot, I hope there is no dip. I hope it's kind of like Solana where it just sits and goes sideways, right? Cause if polka dot sits on 44, once it turns higher, it's going through 58 in my opinion, not investment advice. Now, AVAX, Forrest told you all about it last week. We were pounding the table on this at multiple levels on multiple live streams. Took out 100 over the weekend after, you know, we got support where we thought around 85. The question is, the question is, is this the type of a trade where if the market goes down, this becomes like a one coin show, right? In other words, could this thing gap to 85? I'm sorry, to 150. Now, I'd love to say because it's tidy, right? Everyone likes it tidy. When this thing was dipping at 85, no one wanted it. So naturally, they went to 100 because everyone FOMO'd in. Now that it's near 100, people are like, well, I'm too scared to buy it. I'll wait for the dip. But the dip has already occurred. So I think with Avalanche, there's actually a risk that this thing goes straight to 150. Now, I'd love to be wrong and be able to buy it at 75 because they kill the market. But if they don't kill the market, you have to be careful of what this thing could do on the upside because there's no resistance until 150. Now, speaking of resistance, Luna is, looking, is starting to get tired, right? This is the third time 
It hasn't been able to get through a GAN structure around, say, 53. So I'm starting to wonder if capital shouldn't be deployed elsewhere if, say, you bought the dip in the 30s, okay, and have been riding this. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just wondering if a, a bigger level of appreciation couldn't be found elsewhere, say, Binance, Polkadot, Avalanche, et cetera. Now, more interesting news of what to do when crypto's corrected. Well, I started out, you heard all of this probably on multiple live streams. Token Metrics TV heard about it every day, which again, if you weren't tuned in in the beginning, we're doing the market update every day on YouTube. Every day. We just haven't figured out the time yet. Make sure you like and subscribe and put alerts on so that you get notified when we start doing it. Coinbase and related crypto equities have been the best ways to get on a trend, okay, in crypto while crypto is either moving sideways, chopping around, etc. Yeah, you're not making a million dollars, but you're not sitting around waiting for Bitcoin to get past 65K. Coinbase could be an NFT and metaverse play along with Facebook. Coinbase's earnings came out and they were kind of bad, right? But the stock is getting bought on dips anyway. So I'm wondering if both Facebook and Coinbase with this NFT metaverse theme isn't a way to trade the metaverse while waiting for crypto to sort of get, to, get it together. And if, <clears throat> if there is no parabolic rally in crypto, there could be a parabolic rally in Coinbase, Galaxy Digital, and grab your barf bag, Facebook, Meta, or whatever it is these days. Head and shoulders bottom, possible five wave up, which means it could really moon in crypto terms. The equity market is figuring out based on a commercial that Facebook is running during American college football games. It's actually a really catchy commercial. It's got a lot of young people in it. And I, I really had to focus in on it at the end to realize that it was Facebook doing its metaverse introduction. It was subtle. And it was like ridiculously cool, if I may say so. So yes, I know we don't like Web 2.0. I know nobody in that Web 2.0 ever gave you a 10K airdrop for participating. I get it. But if there's consolidation in crypto, there may be money to be made in Facebook, right? So you could like switch back and forth. It's like, okay, I can trade Bitcoin. And then when Bitcoin doesn't do anything, I'll trade Galaxy and Coinbase. Then there's like Decentraland and Sandbox. And when that's consolidation, consolidating, I'll go trade Facebook. It's all the same trade. Now, speaking of Decentraland, <clears throat> so the BTFD strategy worked right? Because it dipped to 225 and came back. So that's good, right? That means like this whole idea that you got to own the metaverse on dips, right? It's not a bull market or a mega bull market unless you can buy dips. And I'm in favor <clears throat> until proven wrong of thinking that these metaverse trades are not just one and done 5X moves and it's over. I'm tending to think particularly the stuff that's traded on Coinbase, that it's going to have legs. So three something might be a good place to buy Decentraland as sellers come in. If the whole market gets hit and you wind up at 225 or at two, that would be a holiday present in my mind. So if the market gets hit all week, you know, long Facebook waiting on Decentraland may be the trade. And then you can get rid of Facebook and go into Decentraland once the dip is done. Sandbox, the same thing, right? Really nice bounce off support at 230. So you know there were buyers down there. I'm not the only person who's thinking buy the dip in this stuff, obviously. Okay, but bull markets have a way of getting tricky, right? The easy money gets made, a theme develops. Everybody wants in on it. <clears throat> Everybody wants to buy, but sometimes people buy at the wrong price. 
because they get impatient. So in Sandbox, I might wait for a test of two, but that may have already happened. So maybe I have to think of it in terms of clock time or the calendar and just see where this is on November 21st. And if it's still in its range, take a shot that way, not investment advice. But again, what's the theme of the market update today? It's shopping while dropping. Overstock.com security tokens, huge consolidation, basically over a year. Okay, this giant flag is going to come to fruition. If crypto breaks out at the end of this year or next year, this stock, this stock went from 20 to 130. Okay, and this flag shows that that type of a move could happen again. So the idea of security tokens and the type of firm that Overstock has transformed itself into, namely a crypto company, crypto companies could have big, big rallies at the end of this year or at the start of next year. Now, speaking of crypto companies, ha ha, let's just keep an eye on Tesla. Tesla, remember, has a ton of Bitcoin. Elon's getting plenty of attention by talking about ringing the register and cashing out. Okay. It's kind of unbelievable that this guy doesn't sell on the way up, but apparently Elon is getting attention for talking about selling his own stock. Meanwhile, what's really happening. Okay. Is that the stock is just going back to fill a gap at 900 and the stock is approaching a former ceiling near that same level. Now, why am I talking about Tesla on a crypto live stream? Well, I want to see if Elon and everybody is selling Tesla, whether or not there's a dip buyer in Tesla, if because of cars and because they own a ton of Bitcoin. Like in stocks, if stocks are getting hit, I want to see stocks and companies that own Bitcoin doing well, assuming Bitcoin is okay. So it's going to be a real test of Bitcoin to see if Tesla holds 900. If Tesla doesn't hold 900, my enthusiasm for Bitcoin will go down. Okay. That could be a reverse indicator, but I'm watching this. Now, a Bitcoin mining company, Marathon, looks like it wants to fill a gap down at 54. So similar to the Tesla read, and it looks like this particular crypto stock actually wants to move lower, which again, fits with the theme, right? Set up what you want to buy, buy it at a reasonable point. 54 in this stock is a former ceiling. It's also the location of a gap. Gaps get filled. Crypto could go down and you want to be scooping it up later on in the week. All right, friends, that is the market update for today. Now, what I would encourage you to do is continue to hit the like and subscribe button because altcoin overtime, which is the sugar that I know you want, which we would love to give you. Yes, this is live. Uh, sandbox will never hit two. I absolutely hope you're right. I absolutely hope so, right? It'd be convenient if I could buy the dip in the metaverse and have it you know, be orderly. So I, I hope you're right. Now that said, altcoin overtime is coming up. So don't go anywhere. Now I'm going to turn this over to the man. And I want you to pay really close attention to what Forrest has got to say, because Forrest has got the map for Bitcoin possibly going out until the spring. Forrest, take it away. Sounds good. I'm going to share my screen here, Bill. Thanks for the legendary market update. If you enjoyed Bill's content, leave a like, definitely subscribe, <clears throat> share the, the live stream and go check out tokenmetrics.com and tokenmetrics TV. All right, guys. Uh, <clears throat> Bill, are you able to see my screen okay now that I've shared it? Yes, I see it on the screen. All right, perfect. And actually on the live stream, though, it doesn't look to be shared. Oh, there we go. 
I'm seeing it now. Sweet. So this is this is a lot, guys. I need I need you guys to to pay close attention. We've got we've got the Bitcoin map here, uh, and it looks very complicated. But I'm going to walk you through it one piece at a tar time, starting from the left, going over to the right. There's a lot here. We're going to break it down one piece at a time so that we can see that our 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 projection for when bitcoin is going to peak because that's the, that's the question everybody has when's bitcoin going? i can't tell you over the last year how many times uh, i've been asked that question when is this market cycle going to peak when is bitcoin going to peak well i've done some studying of the previous halvings and peaks and previous market cycles so that we can arrive at a reasonable projection for both price and for when we're going to hit that price Right. So over on the left here, we've got this first market cycle, right? From our having, right? From our having to our peak to our next having, right? That was our market cycle. That market cycle lasted 4.62 years, 1,687 days. From having to peak was 728 days or 43% of the having to having market cycle. 57% or 959 days of this having to having market cycle was after the peak, pretty much the bear market. Now, within this peak, we had two distinct peaks or within this market cycle, rather, we had two distinct peaks. These peaks can be measured from the overall market cycle trend line. That's in white here. This white line here is the overall market cycle trend line taken from the trajectory of our initial bullish price action. Then we get a separation, a parabolic run up or two in this case, away from this trend line. We can measure the risk premium or measure how long it would take this trend line to catch up to the, the premium or the price that Bitcoin traded at at that peak, right? So at this peak, the first peak, it would have taken the trend line 600 days to catch back up to this price level. And it actually did. 600 days later, Bitcoin was barely above this peak price, right? Now in the second peak or the overall market cycle peak, the all-time high at the time, just over $1,200, it was 700 days to fair value, right? By fair value as denominated by this trend line. So this trend line was, it would have taken 700 days to catch up based on its initial trajectory to this peak price. Now let's jump into our next market cycle. Our next market cycle, right? Was from peak or from having to peak, from having to peak was 518 days, right? From peak to having, it was 882 days. For a total market cycle having to having of 1,400 days or 3.83 years. 37% of this market cycle was the bull market from having to peak and 63% was the peak to having or bear market. Now, this time we had one singular blow off top. We didn't have a double peak market cycle, just one singular blow off top that occurred at a risk premium of 854 days from its fair value. So now we have kind of three peaks that we can measure in terms of our days to fair value, right? So our peaks have occurred between 600 and 854 days to fair value, right? What we can do in this current market cycle is project the next halving, which is projected to occur on March 25th or March 26th of 2024, right? Based on the current hash rate, based on the current uh, mining of Bitcoin, we can project this out to the future, March of 2024, right? Then we can take our scenarios of how long from having to peak, right? In the past, having to peak in the blue here, 728 days and 518 days. And we can measure out from our last halving and say, well, what happens if we were to peak 518 days after the halving, like we did in the last market cycle? Well, in that case, that then we would have peaked on October 11th, right? We're already past October 11th. Okay, that, that's, that's fine. 
Well, what about 728 days after the halving? Well, that gives us kind of an upper bound of May 9th of 2022. May 9th of 2022, if we were to peak 728 days after our halving, which is what we did in the first market cycle. Whoops. Now, I, I'll, I'll mention this was a double peak market cycle. We are currently in what would be called a double peak market cycle if we were to top at 64K and then run to 120K or so right before going into a bear market or wherever we end up peaking at, whatever price we peak at, this would be characterized as a double peak market cycle if we did that, which is more similar to the 728 day scenario, which takes longer to play out. Makes sense. Two peaks takes longer to play out than one single peak. We can also do the reverse. We can say, well, what if we measure back from our halving, right? We're projecting our halving in March of 2024. And we can take our first scenario of 959 days from <clears throat> our first halving. And that would give us a lower bound of the market cycle peaking around August 9th of 2021. Well, we're already past there, right? This dotted up and down line uh, denotes the current present day, right? Which is November 15th. So we're already past our, our two lower bounds of when we could see this market cycle peak, August or October, right? We're already into no November and we're still making Bitcoin all-time highs. Our next scenario is 882 days from our next halving, right? Which was the, the last market cycle scenario here, 882 days. That would bring us back to about November 1st or October 25th. Again, we're already past that date. So from our, our scenario model here, we can project this, this box, if you will, this box or this time frame of roughly nine months from August 9th to May 9th, August 9th of 2021 to May 9th of 2022. But since we're already several months past this, we've actually now gotten into a situation where we can zero in a little bit and, and say, well, now we're, we're operating in this six month time frame. At the latest, we're expecting May 9th of 2022 because that would be 728 days after the halving. And that's the longest we've seen it take so far. Now, of course, could we see some, uh, something new happen? Could we see a triple? Could we see a triple peak where we go up to 120K, come down to 100, maybe 80, and then pop back up to 200, 240K or 180K? Yeah, but what we're trying to do is figure out the time frame for the next peak. If we see a triple peak market cycle, that's fantastic. But obviously in a triple peak market cycle scenario, we still want to be able to sell at the second peak just like you wanted to be able to sell at 60 to 64K at the first peak in this market cycle so you could rebuy at 30K, right? So what if we say, all right, well, we're currently here in November and this market cycle could go all the way till May 9th reasonably, right? Or at least this next peak could take all the way until May 9th. What if we take a measurement of 43% of this market cycle, right? Because this 728 days was 43% of the overall market cycle. The market cycle this time from having to having is expected to be shorter, right? Because of the increase in Bitcoin mining power, right? So we have this 1,407 days from having to having projection. What if we go 43% of the way into that like we did in our previous double peak market cycle? Well, that would take us to January 10th. That would take us to January 10th, which is, I think, a pretty reasonable time frame for a, a nice aggressive move for Bitcoin here in the end of December, into December, or end of November rather, into December and towards the first half of January. I think we could absolutely peak at 120K by, by January. And I say 120K because $120,000 is a very, very big resistance level for Bitcoin, right? Based on margin pressure levels, you can see that 30K was the floor here. Right? And then our next resistance based off of that 30K margin pressure level was 60K. We had a ton of resistance at 60K. We, we broke through it and ran it up to 65K, 64.8. But 60K has been the big resistance. And that's because once you get to, once Bitcoin's price gets to 60K, you can no longer buy it on 2X leverage and hide your liquidation point below these, uh, this 30K floor here. 
right? So what we're seeing right now is Bitcoin's popping above 60K and making 60K the new floor. It's building out the floor here. And as we get more confidence, I think the next stop is going to be 80, 90, and then 120K. So my next peak price prediction for Bitcoin is actually around 120K. Now, if we were to see a triple peak market cycle where Bitcoin came back down from 120K, saw a correction, found a floor at like 80, 80 to 90K, maybe even revisited 60K one more time like we did this time around. Maybe it could then move to 180K or 240K, but I don't think that Bitcoin's going to 240K in January or even in May of 2022. I just don't think that's realistic because if it did, what would the days to fair value be from our current trend line? Remember, our previous market cycles peaked at 600, 700, 854 days to fair value respectively. Now, of course, these trend lines do decrease over time because we know Bitcoin's following a logarithmic regression pattern, logarithmic regression band, right? The, the trend line, the support trend line ends up getting less and less steep, meaning it's less and less volatile. It, it goes up to a lesser and lesser degree each market cycle, right? Somewhat of diminishing returns, diminishing volatility, which is, which is a good thing, right? But if we took a measure from, let's just pop our cursor up here to 240K by January, right? And measure out to this trend line, we're looking at 1,253 days to fair value, 1,253 days for this trend line to pick up. And I, I just don't think that people are going to be willing to buy, especially the amount of the, the, the institutions that would have to come in to drive this price to 240K by this January timeframe. I don't think that they're going to be comfortable buying Bitcoin at this high of a premium. I just don't think they, they will because in the past, no one has ever been willing to buy Bitcoin at that much of a days to fair value premium, right? More, more the, the highest Bitcoin's traded at is 854 days to fair value. Now, we can also take these days to fair value scenarios of 700 days and 854 days and measure backwards from our trend line and back in right? Measure, measure backwards from our trend line to our May 9th projection and say, well, where would Bitcoin be if it was trading at 700 to 854 days to fair value as of May 9th, 2022? Well, at 700 days to fair value, which is where we peaked in the first market cycle, we'd be trading at a Bitcoin price of 106K. If we traded at 854 days to fair value, which was where we peaked at in our second market cycle, we'd be trading at a Bitcoin price of 143K. So this 120K big resistance level is right smack in the middle of both of these levels. So between January, my, my projection for when this, this market cycle will peak or when Bitcoin will peak and what price it will peak at is between January 10th and May 9th, of 2022. So we've got about a four to five, really, yeah, about a four month time frame here. And as far as price goes, I think 120K, 120K is big resistance. And the days to fair value risk is risk premium is in line with where we've recently peaked in the past. Now, I do think that there is a chance we get a parabolic increase. And maybe we see Bitcoin run up to 180K. That would be the next margin pressure level, resistance level after 120, after 120K, more than likely. And then we'd be seeing a days to fair value valuation of about 980 days. Let's just round that to 1,000. Well, the first market cycle peaked at 700 days. Second market cycle was able to withstand more risk on a lower, uh, a less steep trend line. Uh, 154 days to fair value higher. So another 154 days on top of it. Well, what if we added another 150 days of risk, risk premium this time around because we have a less steep trend line? Well, then we're probably talking about 1,000 days to fair value. Well, add 1,000 days to fair value, that would be about 180K Bitcoin, right? So I think we could go to 120 with a stretch target of 180K. By January, between January and May, of 2022. So I hope you enjoyed this analysis. If you did, please do hit the like button, subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and check out Tokenmetrics TV. Now I'm going to kick it back over to Bill for altcoin overtime. All right. Thank you, Forrest. You know, 
There's people who are smart and then there's Forrest. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. I've been in this business for a while. So, you know, Forrest goes through a lot of really detailed stuff. And if you're watching this live, ironically, I would actually encourage you not only to watch our live stream, but go back and watch some of the stuff that Forrest does again and again, because it, <laughs> it's super helpful to me when I got to do my work like altcoin overtime. Today, because again, we're expanding our YouTube content. Here's a question. What's my personal favorite altcoin and why? This will be the last slide. Don't go anywhere without further ado, altcoin overtime. People have been asking me about Casper. I have said, you know, it, it's tough to hate it, but you have to watch out for tax loss selling. Then I came up with the idea this morning that stuff that has underperformed may start rallying as the market either goes down or goes sideways. Lo and behold, somebody's in my Twitter pointing out that Casper is up today. Now, if Casper really ramps, it could go to 30 cents or 36. Maybe everyone has already given up in this coin. So if you've been in it, I don't see any reason to give up right now unless your accountant is telling you to, not investment or tax advice. So while the market's going down, this fits the profile of a bunch of coins that look like they actually want to turn around and go up even if the market's going down, okay? Gala is another one of those coins we tracked a week ago on a four-hour chart, okay? And I'm noticing the big green candle today. Now, it's always easy to be bullish on a green day. I know, but this looks like synthetics back in the day, that up and sit in that broad range. So this formation traditionally has been bullish, so keep an eye on that coin. Now, the coin everybody loves to hate and hates to love at the same time, Sheeb. Okay. <clears throat> Sheeb goes up, institutions unload, but retail shows up at the critical 62% retracement. Now, if Avalanche can go to 150, could Sheeb make a new high? In other words, could it be a one, two, or three coin market when it turns, if it turns, either near Thanksgiving or F it, maybe Sheeb just wants to do it now. I mean, they have been banging on this 62% level for most of late October and November. So yeah, okay, we missed it the first time, but you know what? So did everybody else. And I'm wondering if people aren't going to take a look at this and go, oh man, I'm not missing this again. I'm buying the dip because that's working in metaverse. Okay. And if people go, you know what? I want in on the dip and there's enough people sit, sitting around a holiday table in November and December going, hey, let's buy Sheeb. People got time on their hands, folks. Sillier things have happened right? 0. 0.0001 is a possible target. Nice round, even number. Okay. Less exciting is Matic, right? It broke out. It came back. I was thinking 295. I'm going to not give up on that. I'm going to hope that this market doesn't get hammered and that Matic can hang out around 175. If it does, it can go to 295. If it doesn't, you know, the trade's over. That's just how I would put it simply. Now, perp all over the place, driving pe people beyond nuts, more so than usual. Perp goes all the way up to 24 and comes back. What to do? I say with perp, you can buy the dips, not investment advice, and you can just try to hodl this. It doesn't really go anywhere. It did get hurt in the flush back in the spring, but it came back quick. So I think perp is like a yield staking play. 
And I'm definitely not giving up on this or DYDX, particularly if Forrest is right. And you've got much, much higher Bitcoin coming in 2022. Okay, Binance Coin talked about this earlier. Don't mind talking about it again. If altcoins catch fire around the holidays, Binance Coin is consolidating just underneath resistance and could spike and go through resistance. Why? Because that's what's been happening all year long. That's been the trade. Buy it on a dip just below resistance and let the big green candle take it through. Lossless, okay, hanging out around a 50% retracement level. I have noticed that that has become in vogue since the start of the metaverse. Now, whether a coin is a part of the metaverse or not, it doesn't seem to matter. I just know that like the 50% retracement is the new 62. So we'll see if that holds in lossless, but this is looking actually decent. Okay. Axie infinity. Is it over in Axie infinity? That's the question. Okay. It looks like absolutely no one has any interest in buying it. But every time it gets in that 140, 130 zone, it seems to just hold. So the easy money has been made and it looks like people are finding a different trade. This may be like Luna in the sense that it's probably over. Okay. That said, if it just sits here, there's a rule in the market, right? Don't short the quiet market. So if crypto gets hammered, Axie could fall to 114. If crypto gets hammered and Axie holds in, okay, you have to be careful. Don't be short it, not investment advice. And there could be a push higher. But right now it looks dead. And when I saw that, I'm like, hmm, it looks dead. Does that mean it is dead or it's waiting for another leg up? I'm interested to see how these gaming coins move near the holiday season. It's either like, you know, buy it in the summer and sell it when it's under the tree, or people are going to go, wow, this is cool. I want it. And they're going to pile in when they have time on their hands over the holidays. Okay. Dash the coin. I love to love and cry because it doesn't go up. Okay, this is now my second favorite altcoin. Okay, I know Bitcoin rules a roost. I knew Bitcoin's got all of Latin America, which is what I thought Dash would do, but I'm still not giving up. Okay, Dash has got resistance at 265. I think I would only get bullish and super long if it took that level out. The reason is, is because Dash versus Bitcoin is actually pushing resistance. So again, Stuff that didn't perform all year may actually start performing while this market either goes down, consolidates, or is generally annoying. For example, another example of generally annoying would be we expect a parabolic after Thanksgiving and we don't get it. And Forrest is right, it's next year. Dash may actually wind up doing well along with these other forgotten coins if that turns out to be the case. Okay, ACH, uh, I believe another forgotten coin, okay, was interesting, did a nice move along with QNT, a payment system. Looks like people are taking profits, but if it can get above 10 cents, I also think this could run. It's been making a base. It looks a little bit visually like the graph in terms of the, the nature of the base it's been making. So what if you were going to build a portfolio of, I don't know, like it's kind of like a Halloween theme, like, you know, mummy coins, right? Like coins that are look dead, but they're going to come back to life. Maybe this would be one of them. Now, speaking of, dead as in like killing you bitcoin cash and the unbelievable volatility you know i caught you know 480 to 720 i believe 
Now it's coming off. With Bitcoin Cash, I think it's simple. If this is involved in the future of money, then Bitcoin Cash's smart contract network is going to have to start pulling in more money. You can track that on DeFi Llama. Technically, as in chart-wise, you want to see it hold 600 to 634, right? Bitcoin Cash holds the next leg up in Bitcoin could be Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash, and Bitcoin Cash all going with it. Or Bitcoin may sit still because of this thing with the ETF until December, and these coins may have another leg. I'm hoping there's another lag after Thanksgiving. That's why I'm bringing it up now. Orion Protocol has support at the 62% retracement at $7.23. One thing I think is so interesting about this coin is that when it went up, it really spiked twice. But when it's come down, it's hit this 62% line like five or six times. So that's really interesting to me. Normally you don't see, I don't know, five or six tests of a 62% level. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I do know this. Throughout the entire two years that I've been at Token Metrics, if a coin can hold above 62% retracement of a big move and not go below it or not stay below it for very long, that can be a sign of strength so, you know, DYOR, not investment advice, but this is an altcoin that may be worth looking deeper into beyond the charts. Ticker symbol NIF, sort of an unbelievable 3X. And the question is, can it keep going? I don't know, but I know there's a big FIB extension point at 63. So if this is going to turn into a complete moonshot, if it closes above 63 and holds on a retest, 114 is possible. All right. Now, if it doesn't get above 63, okay, be careful of FOMOing into a super hot coin in the middle of a correction. So I want you to catch those moonshots, but I don't want you to get killed if this thing turns around and, you know, the rally's either over or you have to wait a month until it breaks back through 63. So keep an eye on that level. Now, GNO, this is a good example of what I was just talking about. GNO was a top performing momentum coin. We had a target of 640. It got there, immediately wicked down and corrected hard. So one thing that I haven't talked about today is what to do with these coins if you're like a KuCoin lottery winner, right? And, you know, you get something that does the 3 to 5x, do you take the money? In the super small coins, I would say yes, because if there's a market correction, you don't want to get killed. You want to ring the register. You can always buy a dip. Now, obviously, when something is 3Xing or 5Xing, it's really hard to get off the train. But manage your greed, as my colleague would say, or as we say at tokenmetrics.com, pay yourself when you're right. Okay, because you don't want to get caught in a Bitcoin flush that's related to something that has nothing to do with crypto, like movements of the futures contract that are held inside the Bitcoin ETF. Now, FTX, you know, I see FTX's logo everywhere sponsoring everything. I think I saw it in the cockpit of Lewis Hamilton's car in that unbelievable F1 race in Brazil for any sports fans out there who saw that. I keep wondering if everything is priced in here or whether there's another leg to 84. When I look at this, I'm like, well, it took out the support in May, but it's come back down again. And it has shown no interest in going to 84 or back to 84, but it's also shown no interest in falling below 53. 
So remember shopping while it's dropping. If this gets hit, I'm wondering if this is a token like Coinbase's stock where, and, and maybe even Binance coin. Now that I think of it is that these exchange tokens may be the final wave of the altcoin move. Okay. The graph again, I'm adding this to the, I want to cry list after it broke out, but maybe not. Maybe the graph is now resting on an old ceiling near a dollar five. So if the graph can hold it together, a turn to 150 is possible. Now, can you believe this volatility in UMA? Okay. This is probably an example of not over trading if you can help it, right? This chart, it just, it screams p l destruction. It's really more of an example, like what I was doing earlier in Chainlink, right? Resistance was at 1875. It went through it, but wicked back down. It retested it and then failed again. And then on the third time, after everybody probably gave up, it looks like it's going to try to take out 1875. Now, with this kind of volatility, with them shaking people out like this, I actually think if this thing holds above 1875 and doesn't get killed the rest of this week, 27 is possible, but it's got to be above 1875. So if this is just whipping and driving for the sake of whipping and driving, don't touch it. But come Friday or Thursday, this thing's hanging around 1875. You know, this volatility could be like winding up the spring for a much bigger move. It's been a while since I've seen really wild price action like this in a Coinbase alt. Okay. In case anyone missed it earlier, Polkadot thought it was going to the moon. It came back to 44. A holiday gift would be a move to 38. That's the 38% retracement of the overall up move. What would really be nice is if Polkadot just hung around 44, which is the 23% retracement. That would give me a lot more confidence that Polkadot could be a major, major leader on the next leg up, either in December or January. Now, everyone likes it tidy. Everyone wants to buy Polkadot. So my hope is, is that Polkadot actually doesn't dip as much as people hope, kind of like Solana and Avalanche, and then turns around on people and takes out 60. Now, just because that's what I want to happen, doesn't mean that's what will happen, but that's how I'm reading that chart right now. Now, just looking at some of our rankings from our sponsor, tokenmetrics.com. These are sort of layer one rankings. So you can actually divide up coins by sector. So some of them have really small market caps. Like, you know, for example, you know, KDA, is a symbol that I've been getting asked about now for three days, has a market cap of 91 million, and it's got a token metrics ranking of 89% and rising. So this is something that people on our low-end platforms and our high-end platforms get access to. And it's something that I use to try to say, okay, hey, check it out there, third from the bottom. How's AVAX and NIR doing? Right? How, how, how are they? How is their score going up? Is it going down? Is it above 80? All useful stuff to me. Okay. Soul, ticker symbol soul, looking like it could get through 236. Okay. Right now it's coming off. But again, this whole idea of a consolidation below resistance. Now it went from 50 to 250. So obviously people are taking profits. The question is, will dip buyers in this show up at the end of the week? If it does, it may be worth a look underneath that resistance at 236 because 375 or a much bigger up move could unfold. Okay, here's KDA. As I was talking about earlier, support around $20.30. Okay, if that holds, you can expect 32. 
If $20.30 doesn't hold, maybe the easy money has been made because after all, this is a 10X. So I don't think I'm in a huge hurry to catch a falling knife in a 10X in the middle of a correction. That said, if buyers show up at support, okay, there are ways to discern what the real momentum trades are that are going to continue to be momentum trades, even if the market goes down. But you have to look at the token metrics rankings and you got to read the chart as a part of your homework. Okay, V chain, pressing, pressing, pressing the top of that accumulation cone near 18 cents. You know what? Let me just come out and say it. I've been a big V chain fan for two years. I know it's got a following. The old resistance point of like 15 cents held on the way down. And I'm just thinking that a V chain breakout seems inevitable. Hopefully, I don't eat those words and it's not investment advice, but the chart on VeChain looks like they want to buy dips. And then when the market kind of gets quiet and goes sideways, they want to take it up. Okay. PHA, ticker symbol PHA, still in this diamond formation, slowly slumping towards the bottom at 67 cents. These type of formations can be wildly powerful. And I'm wondering if a dip below 67 cents, if it dips below it and comes back, that could be a sign it's going to break out at the top of the diamond formation. So this is definitely worth keeping an eye on because this diamond formation is huge. The bottom of it, it's like 40 cents and the top of it's at 140. So diamonds can normally create these huge moves and if you get that, you know, in this coin, okay, that could lead to a big up move. Now, again, if it goes below 67 cents and stays below it, don't touch it, right? Especially if it just sits down there, languishes for like a period of like a month, all right? With a diamond, if there's a false breakout through the bottom, you want it to come back quick, quick, okay? ICP still looking like it's trying to break out. So staying with that Cardano, Cardano thought this was really going to go after it went up above 221 and it's running back into profit takers. Really don't want to see Cardano go back to 180. So it's not a love it or hate it type of thing right here at two. It's fine. But if this thing actually went down to 180, that could mean that the whole layer, the layer one trade is exiting Cardano and going somewhere else. Personally, I hope two holds and it goes to three, but the chart is the chart. Don't want to see Cardano go down really much more than it has. Now, what you have been waiting for, what is my favorite altcoin? What's the altcoin that I have? Once upon a time, I went to the Texas Bitcoin conference and I saw a huge booth for a company named Polymath that was in security tokens. So coming from an equities background, I was absolutely fascinated along with 70,000 other people on Telegram about this company that was going to take equity and stocks and put it on the blockchain. Now. Polymath went from zero to $14 in 2017 and proceeded to go from $14 to zero because it was interesting that you could tr issue or list security tokens. You could put them in people's wallets, but you couldn't trade them. There were no DEXs. There was no buying and selling mechanisms. And for sure, back in 2017, when Bitcoin was embarrassing the whole world, including Wall Street, certainly Wall Street was not going to get involved in security tokens. Flashing forward, Polymath, not giving up, gets listed on Coinbase. Why? Because Coinbase is going to start doing custody on security tokens. In fact, there's a real estate company that has issued 
security tokens, tokenized real estate through Polymath's listing mechanism, and Coinbase currently custodies that. Polymath has rebuilt its blockchain into something called Polymesh, which will have a token PolyX. Polymesh is compatible with Polkadot. So in the future, security tokens will theoretically be able to be traded on Polkadot. And as I understand it from a whale who admittedly has a big position in this, security tokens, because it's built with Polkadot technology, Polymesh that is, could actually wind up being traded on any DEX as Web3 takes off. Now, why did I get involved in Polymath and Polymesh? Well, one, I loved it at, you know, seven. So you have to love it at 70 cents. That's just a smart ass trading thing. Two, I said, well, what's it going to do? Go to zero twice? You know, normally when you die, you know, you ever heard the saying to hell and back? Well, it died, it went to hell and it's back. Is it going back to zero? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe something else is going to happen. How about this? Total speculation, right? In research, you get paid for imagination. Right now, security tokens are out there. Our guys have gone through all this. They agree that it's good. It's interesting. But they, they say two things. One, no one cares about security tokens. That's true. And two, there's no way to trade the security tokens. Then I said, hmm, we're looking for a parabolic move in the market. In order to create a parabolic move, you got to have a surprise. You got to have a surprise. What's the surprise that gets this market going? A bored ape on Rolling Stone magazine cover? That's not a surprise. It's cool, but it's got to be shocking. How about this? How about Wall Street gets involved in blockchain security tokens? I mean, what's Wall Street going to do? They're going to go, you know what? We've changed our mind. <laughs> Ethereum has uh, 15x and we're going to get involved now. Or are they going to say, hmm, let's try security tokens. Because if there's no way to buy and sell them, maybe they can buy and sell them through us. And all it takes is a big investment bank to say, hey, We'll make markets in security tokens. We'll help you buy them and sell them because we want to get into crypto. We don't want to get into Bitcoin, but we want to get, you know, want to get hip. We want to get with it. It's a way for them to get in early and act like they haven't missed it. So what did I do? Well, I bought a little and I just left it. And I took the advice of one of our analysts and, and he was dead right. He's like, look, this has got huge potential. But the question is, does anybody want to do the trade? That's why I have a reasonable position. And his conclusion, which I thought was fascinating, because I learned from him, just like I learned from Forrest, and then I pass it on to you. He's like, you may be better buying this thing on a breakout above one, or I think buying this on a big breakout after today and taking the next couple of dips and seeing if it holds. This thing has spiked up a couple times. There was a head and shoulders bottom. And the question is, will the polymath bag holders from 2017 get filled when they sell to new buyers who want to take this much higher, anticipating some sort of catalyst related to Wall Street, Polkadot, an underrated theme, you know, a lot of people say polymath is next market cycle. They could be right. That could be true, honestly. However, consider this. Chainlink came out in 2017, went to zero, came back. Synthetics, Cardano, all of these 2017 plays, and I believe CryptoPunks too, correct me if I'm wrong, came out in 2017. Polymath may be one of the few 2017 plays that went to zero that has a shot at coming back. So I bought a little. Now 
I got a big green candle, which I didn't even see until right before I had to do this little episode. <laughs> My answer is, why not? Because when I think about polymath, it's the same thing with Dash, okay? It's the same thing maybe with Casper. They're not the same themes, but this whole idea in conclusion that maybe towards the end of this year, you got to look at the stuff that people either missed, like the metaverse and Sheeb and want to buy the dip or stuff that's underperformed that should have done well. Forest Coin Nano don't have the chart, but that's included in that grouping, right? Quality stuff, interesting stories that have not moved. So not to over pump this, but it's a lesson. What is the story? What is the story of the altcoin you're interested in, right? What is the story? If you know the story, you can survive the correction and you'll figure out when it's time to buy it, whether that's Thanksgiving or at the end of December. And that is altcoin overtime. Thanks for that, Bill. It was epic. So how was my connection? Did everybody hear that? Yeah. I could. I, I Coming through crystal clear for me. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is a live stream, folks. We appreciate you being here with us. We appreciate all the people who have commented. Uh, the market update is coming every day starting very soon. It actually started today. And we are going to be coming to you at a time when we hope you can catch us before all the other crypto YouTubers get out there. So as this next leg of the market cycle kicks off, up, down, we're going to do intraday charts. So I'm going to branch out into tactical thinking. So make sure you have that alerts button on. Please stay with us and don't forget, give our love to our sponsor, tokenmetrics.com. So on behalf of Forrest, on behalf of our sponsor, we thank you for being here today. This is Bill Noble from Token Metrics. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.